The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome uh, to Southside Bible Church. If you are visiting, we are grateful to have you uh, here with us. Glad you would come and, and worship our Christ together and just grateful for you. Today is the last Sunday before Christmas and we're going to finish up a series that I've been preaching on for the last month, and we've been just seeking to prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And we, we've seen some beautiful promises and truth that I, the good news is I'm going to review for the last time, but I pray that you will just review for them the rest of your life. The first uh, part in our series, part one, we went to Genesis 3. And we saw the first prophecy in the Bible of the coming of Jesus Christ, and it was right in the middle of, of the serpent who came and broke paradise with Adam and Eve when they sinned, and God makes this promise, I'm going to come, these two seeds are going to be opposed to each other, the seed of Eve and the seed of the serpent, and it's kind of the history of the world of, of them fighting against each other and through the rest of Genesis. But, but I'm going to send a seed that's going to come uh, from Adam, from Eve, who's going to crush the serpent on the head and undo the works of the devil and what he did in Genesis 3. So we began setting our focus on that sweet promise that a seed of Eve is going to come and undo what the devil destroyed and accomplished uh, in that garden. And, and he was just a, a dupe, the devil, just in the hand of the sovereign hand of God and what he was doing to bring about this glorious picture of, of his son who would come and bring a redemption to his people and to this world. The second part we looked at was in Genesis 12. And God calls Abraham out, this worshiper of stars, and he, he calls him out and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. I'm going to bless uh, your, your people, a nation, and then all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through a seed that will come from you. And in, in this seed, this blessing is going to be all of grace. So Abraham believes God and it's reckoned to him as righteousness. So it, it's God saying, I'm going to do everything. We looked at the covenant that, that they walked between the animals and it was just God who went through the animals saying, I will do everything necessary to accomplish this salvation. It's not you and me together. It's what I will do to bring blessing to all who will look upon this seed singular, Jesus Christ. Then we looked a little bit that day at Moses. And we saw that a law was given to Moses and it says, obey it and you will be blessed. Keep the law. And that doesn't sound like the Abrahamic covenant. How does this work now? Obey and keep the law and you will get blessed. And that's where we saw the seed promised. He had to come and be born under the law. He had to come now. That law was given and, and God saying it must be fulfilled in order for you to have fellowship with me. But the seed is going to come and he's going to perfectly fulfill the law. And therefore, this, this promise to Abraham, it all marries in Jesus Christ. The law served uh, of uh, the promise. It, it showed you you couldn't keep it. No one could keep this law. And so the seed came in and he perfectly kept it so that now in Christ, the law will be fulfilled and we can be blessed by this promise made to Abraham by grace through faith. And then we came to 2 Samuel 7 and we looked at the Davidic covenant. This seed is going to come also from David and he's going to sit on a throne and his reign will last forever and ever. His kingdom will have no end. And this just keeps getting flushed out. And the last time we were together, we went to Isaiah 9. There was just one more thing about this seed that we, we wanted to look at. And this, this seed is going to happen to have the name Mighty God. So he's going to come from uh, the seed of Eve. He's going to be, come from the seed of Abraham. He's going to come from the seed of David. And he's going to come from the seed of God. He will be fully God and fully man for unto us a son will be given. And so now, Israel is waiting in hope for God to keep these beautiful promises that He has made throughout the history of the world. And there have been so many obstacles that have come against this great promise of God, like sin and unrighteous kings and unrighteous people in Israel. And you just keep seeing all these oppositions to God's plan and promise and what He will do. Nations are conquering and taking Israel into captivity. 
And now there has been no word from God from any prophet for 400 years. They're under the reign of, of, of Rome, Roman rule. There's, there's no prophets. There's, there's very few righteous left in the land. It looks like it's done. A candle that is flickering and going out. And that's the context that we're going to take up here this morning as the sunrise from on high, his beams now are going to break forth in the world where Isaiah said the land sat in darkness and this light is going to come into the world and it's going to shine and reveal the glory of God in the face of Christ. It will give light to those who sit in sin and darkness. And that's the hope if any of you have walked in here this morning in this darkness is that we're going to look now at the light that came into the world to bring salvation to mankind. So let us go to our God and pray that he will meet us now as we look at this. Father, I thank you for the glories of what we've seen, this seed that you promised to the world to bless the nations, Lord. We have been looking and marveling at the way you have portrayed this and what you have said this seed would be. God, I thank you for it, and I thank you now this morning as we will look at its fulfillment. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and open eyes to see the glorious, beautiful seed that was born into Bethlehem's manger. God, I pray that your Spirit would open eyes, that uh, those who have never seen him this morning, Lord, that you would say, let there be light, and they would see it. And I pray for the believers, Lord, the glorious believers here this morning, let our hearts be full with what you gave to us that Christmas morning and let us surrender to the King whose kingdom will have no end and surrender all of our hearts and all of our lives to that King. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 1. That's where we'll be this morning. Luke chapter 1, the gospel of Luke. Luke is seeking to show Theophilus and, and really all who will ever read this gospel that God's fulfillment of his promised seed is now breaking into the history of the world. He wants to make sure you don't miss it and you see it. In Luke chapter 2, which we'll look at tomorrow night, uh, the seed is going to come. He's going to be born into this world. The creator of the world is going to enter into the world that he created. He's going to write himself in the, to the story to come and redeem what happened in Genesis 3. So some really cool things are going on so far in Luke. And Luke is showing us God's plan of salvation. He's showing us the fulfillment of what has been promised to Israel. And this seed is the puzzle piece that brings the whole picture together. The Old Testament is not a bunch of disconnected stories, but it's the unfolding of God's perfect plan of redemption and His Son. And so Luke has started then with the fulfillment of the forerunner who had come before Jesus Christ, John the Baptist. And he shared the story, there's a priest named Zacharias, and he's doing his service in the temple as a priest. And while he's in there doing his service, he's visited by the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel comes and tells him, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be great, and he's going to turn many of the sons of Israel back to the fathers and back to God. The problem is he's old, and his wife is barren. And the response by Zacharias is unbelief. And at that point, the angel says, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to speak. You're struck mute until the birth of your son. And then the birth comes. And they, they got to name the child. And Elizabeth says his name's going to be John. And everyone's like, wait a minute. You don't have anyone in your family named John. Zacharias, what should his name be? And he writes on a tablet, John is his name. After nine months now of not being able to speak, God looses his tongue and Zacharias breaks his silence. And he's had nine months, I believe, to, to read and ponder and, and look through the Old Testament and, and just this season of, of being shut up, which I think none of us will ever get the fullness of the incarnation without this. John Piper said there's a close connection between stillness and a sense of the stupendous. So turn off your TVs and phones and pads and ponder and slow down at the busiest time of the year. I want you to slow down and ponder and meditate on these things. 
And right now, Zacharias has had those nine months, and he's going to break out into a song with the sounds of the sweetest melody maybe recorded in the New Testament, the song of salvation. It's been called the Benedictus of Zacharias. And it tells us, if you'll look in verse 66 and 67, uh, verse 67, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. So he's filled with the Spirit. He's now going to make this prophecy. This is what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. There's a worship and there's an awe of Jesus Christ. There's an amazement at our saving God. You finally get it, what God has been doing, and you're overwhelmed and you're taken up with Christ. And I want to uh, glance over this amazing song, and I'm going to use self-control to to not get stuck on one piece. It's, It's a song that you must listen to in one sitting I believe. So the first thing I don't want you to miss, then come with me uh, to verse 68 now as he begins his song. Uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. That is what is filling my heart this last month in our study, in our series. Blessed be your name. Just taken up with God and the name and Jesus Christ and who he is. This plan is too wonderful for words. It just should be adored. It should be worshiped and praised. I hope you've been blown away with what God has done in history. And what I love is, is if this was my son, John, I think I would be bragging and writing books and doing interviews about this kid born to me when we were barren. Zacharias, his son is eclipsed in this song. The song is about his son. They're all saying, what great things are happening? Who is this kid going to turn out to be? And his song is all about Jesus Christ. When he gets to his son, what he will say and do to get people ready for Christ. John will get the same thing. When he comes, he's going to say, Jesus Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease. You can see the Father and the Son are getting the beauty. This is all about Christ. I need to become less. He needs to become everything. This this is uh, the Son of God who's come into the world to save sinners. There's so much here Uh, to see your life then as to how it points to God and how of telling of His wonders. That's how you're to think about your life, the way they're thinking. The purpose for your life is Him. Everything should be now focused in light of who He is. That's how I think about my life as a parent. Whatever it is, I think now in light of Christ as everything, and that's what these people are doing in in this song. If you're struggling this Christmas, it could be that your focus is on you and not the wonder of Zacharias's heart. So this morning, I just want to lift your gaze again to the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ and marvel. Verse 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us. This is in the past tense. He went from unbelief to so certain now of the promise of God that what he has said he will do It's done because He has said it. He has visited us. I think this is the whole Bible in a phrase. God coming to bring His people back to Him where He will be their God and they will be His people. Where He will be their Father and they will be sons and daughters. Zacharias glances at the present and he's like, God's visited us. And now his song, he's going to glance at the past and he's going to see that it's, it's all being fulfilled. The promises that were made thousands and thousands of years ago are being fulfilled right now in history. He gets it. Here it is. His name is John, which means God is gracious. There's no other way to describe the incarnation of Jesus Christ than that God is gracious. He's a gracious God to give his son. Zacharias sings because there's something greater than his own healing. It's not even that, man, now I can speak. I'm I'm singing about the healing of the nations by the seed that is now going to bless the whole world. And so let's take a look at some of the things that Zacharias sees this one being born that he's going to tie it to. And this one little song, again, it links your whole Bible together, this whole series that we've been doing Uh, This is amazing what we're about to look at. So come 
with me. First, I want you to see the crushing of the serpent's head, the undoing of the works of the devil in the garden that we studied in Genesis 3. What did we lose in paradise? What did we see there? We, we lost God. We were separated and now estranged from God, what we've been made for. The only way we'll ever be right is with God, and we've been separated and and taken away, and now there's an angel with a sword that moves in every direction to get back into the presence of God. His sword of justice will not let you back into the presence of God. Sin has separated you. God's justice has to be satisfied. Fellowship has been broken with God as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve that has come and and been uh, passed on to every one of us. God has visited us. He's visited us and he's accomplished redemption to to buy us back, to, to bring us back to God, to fix this whole mess of what happened in Genesis 3. God is bringing you back to himself. He's fixing the curse and he sets the foundation for his song on this first verse in 68. For he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has visited us. I wanted to start with Adam. He's created, we saw, in a relationship with God. He's an image bearer and he's communing with God. He's walking with God in the garden. Sin entered the world. Death spread to all men. And the sin has brought separation from God. It's the saddest thing ever. It just separated us. The fruit of the world that we live in now is under a curse, and it's separated, and it's all fallen and turned against each other, and even creation, we are separated from God. And now God calls out a a person or a people we saw with Abraham, come out, and I'm going to establish the nation of Israel, and Israel, I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. And then Leviticus, Moses uh, is building now, there's a sacrificial system that he gives to them so I can be your people. And he was to take an offering from the people of Moses for the construction of a temple. And listen to Exodus 25, 8. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. I'll be among them. I will dwell with them. And then God instructs to give them the sacrifice of atonement. The atonement sacrifice to come and atone for sin. And he gives it to Moses on a mountain. And while he gives it to him, the people ask Aaron, make a God then who will go before us. They thought Moses was dead. And they take a molten calf that they make out of gold. And Aaron says, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And so atonement is given to preserve the fellowship of this sinful people called Israel. And so throughout the Old Testament, the promise of God again and again, I will come and I will restore everything. There's no other remedy in Isaiah 59. Their distance and their lostness and their despair and their misery and their sin, the promise of God says, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. A redeemer is going to come to this world. I will enter in it. The light is going to shine into the darkness and I will bring a salvation. I will be your God. And you'll be my people is such a great promise. In Revelation 21, three times, I will be among my people. I will be among my people. I will be with my people. This is the great hope of Israel. And now, as we saw in Isaiah 7 last week, a virgin is going to bear a baby and his name is going to be Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It's going to, God is going to come and enter into this world And Zacharias is now singing, going, God has visited us. This is what we've been waiting for. God has come into the world. He's come to earth and he's accomplishing a redemption for his people to bring us back to God. This is the climax of everything. And Zacharias gets it. And this is the beauty of the whole new covenant. I love in Hebrews, he says, through this atonement now, he says, we can draw near to God. We can all now, as children of God, we can draw near to God. He's accomplished a redemption. He's made a way to bring us back to God, where He is our God and we're His people, back into relationship. Zacharias sees that. That's what God is doing. He sees that his son, John, who was born to him in his old age, 
was to be the forerunner of the one who was God, who is the Messiah who has visited us. Pretty special day for this man, and I can see why he is singing as we look and realize the reality of what's going on. Well, my question is, how does Zacharias know that God's going to bring this salvation? Well, he gets it because he's a covenant-keeping God, hesed, uh, covenantal faithfulness. He will keep his promises that he made to Abraham and David and in Isaiah. So let's take a look then at the first covenant that he realizes is being fulfilled. Uh, look at verse 69. We're going to see the Davidic covenant is now being fulfilled. Look in verse 69. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. And so he's raised up a horn of salvation. This is so rich in Old Testament history. A horn is not something you push in a car if you, someone swerves in your lane. He's not talking about a musical instrument. The horn is a symbol of power. In Psalm 18.2, the psalmist says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. And it, it really came from the animal world. The horn was represented to conquer and to kill. That, that, that horn on a rhino or, or, or a bull ride or whatever, it's, it's, it's power. It's coming. Deuteronomy 33, 17 says this. As the firstborn of his ox, majesty is his. And his horns are the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the peoples all at once to the ends of the earth. And those are the ten thousands of Ephraim and those who are the thousands of Manasseh. They're going to come. This is a picture of what Christ is coming to do. The great ox lowering his horns and driving out all the peoples. Hannah sings a song in 1 Samuel 2.10. She says, those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. Here is that mighty Savior that they have been looking for, that great deliverer, that conqueror. He would come and defeat sin and Satan and death. Zacharias is going to say he's going to defeat all of our enemies, our spiritual enemies that are opposed and against us. Here comes the champion of our salvation, the mighty Christ, a horn of salvation to come. He's mighty and able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. This is a, a great moment for Israel. Zacharias is smack dab in the middle of the unfolding saga. He says he's going to raise up a horn in the house of David, his servant. Look back to Luke 1, verse 32. The Davidic covenant is what we studied a few weeks ago. But when Mary gets this, uh, the, Gabriel comes and tells her there's going to be the Holy One, the Holy Embryo is going to be within you, Jesus Christ. And in verse 32, this child will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Zacharias is getting it, saying, here he is. This is the king that has been promised. And we saw that God would raise up a king then from the line of David, whose kingdom will have no end. This is the great hope. Their kingdom has fallen, and they've been waiting for this one. And Zacharias knew that Mary was from the line of David. Here comes our king, this seed. This one will be the horn that will drive out our enemies. The kingdom of this king will have no end. This is the hope of Israel. Uh, some 40 verses in the Old Testament look back to that promise in 2 Samuel 7 of this king. This was what they were waiting for. This is what they were hoping, and we need that king. And, and Zacharias says, here he is. Christ would be born. He would die on a cross for sinners. He would ascend to heaven and be seated at the right hand of God to rule and reign over his kingdom. 
and He's doing it not yet what it will fully be. There'll be a day when this King will come and His uh, invisible Lordship will come to visible and He will rule and reign forever. And so we live kind of where He's ruling and reigning in a spiritual kingdom right now as it's advancing and we're waiting for this kingdom fulfillment in Christ. Look at uh, Zach, um, Luke 1, 70, what he says of, of it. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. This king will bring deliverance from their enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. This song clearly has a, a spiritual emphasis. I don't know how much Zechariah got this or not with the physical and the spiritual, but for sure this horn is going to bring about a salvation. Look at verse 74. To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve Him without fear and holiness and righteousness before Him all of our days. He's going to bring about a salvation from our enemies of the devil and the law where God must punish it. Uh, and, and, and all of our enemies, our spiritual enemies against us, He will come and bring a salvation from that that holds us in bondage and condemnation. And He saw this King bringing a deliverance from their enemies. And in the new covenant that he, he's about to mention, it's a deliverance from sin and Satan and death and all who hate us. Our king, the horn of salvation, is here. The conquering king has come. Here is the fulfillment of the king from the line of David who would sit on his throne and his kingdom would have no end. That king has visited us and he has come near and this child. Thirdly, I want you to look at the Abrahamic covenant. As the Davidic covenant kind of focuses more on the rule of this seed, uh, this one was more on the blessing that God promised to the nations through his seed. And so it's more of this idea that God's going to bring you into a relationship with himself where he will be our God and we will be his people. Look at verse 72. Zechariah says he's going to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Well, what holy covenant is that? Verse 73, it's the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. He swore several things to Abraham when we looked at that, but the one we focused in on was that all the nations are going to be blessed through him. That is the part now that Zechariah is emphasizing. He's showing in verse 74, he's going to grant us to be delivered from the hand of our enemies that we might serve him without fear. So the joy of salvation is the, the fear of this holy God who you, Israel knew you could not approach him. You couldn't just walk near or you were consumed. He's a holy, wrathful God with a sword of justice and he's angry against sin. There's no way back to God. And now he's saying this one is going to come and now we can serve God without fear. Through Messiah, we can be in the presence of God now and serve him without fear. Oh my, what this one born in Bethlehem will do for the people of God. 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Guys, we can be in his presence. We can have communion and fellowship with God. And I want you to hear this without the fear of judgment. I, I, let that take your breath away. This God that we see revealed in all of his holiness, I can now come back into his presence without fear adoption, accepted, and loved. This is an unbelievable salvation that God has given to us. You can now have communion with God. How? Well, because of a new covenant. We've not just been rescued from our enemies and those who hate us. We've been rescued to something. We've been rescued to serve God without fear to serve Him in relationship and adoption. The joy of being brought back to God. He says in verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before Him all of our days. We can serve Him without fear in a holiness and righteousness before Him 
all of our days. Because the branch, the Messiah, the horn, we now stand in Christ. And we stand in Christ, he's saying, holy and righteous before him. We can stand righteous in the sight of God this morning. Because Moses came and he gave a law that demanded perfection. And Christ comes and he fulfills that in all of his righteousness. And that is why we can serve him without fear. What he is saying now, you can come and be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. By faith, that obedience, that righteousness can be put to your account this morning. To be in the presence of God, standing in your own righteousness, you'll be like a twig being thrown into the midday sun. You'll be consumed if your hope is to stand in the presence of God by your goodness and your morality and your niceness, you will be consumed because that holiness demands his justice to be satisfied and he demands that you have a perfect righteousness to be in his presence. And so in comes the Son of God and he visits us and he fulfills the requirements of perfect righteousness. And now that is put it to your account and you're wrapped in that righteousness and you can stand before this God holy and blameless this morning. Holy and blameless because of Christ's righteousness, not your own. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Now because of that, we're the people of God. And that old saying, quorum Deo, for the face of God. We can now live in the presence of God, holy and righteous and safe and adopted and loved. That's what was born into that manger that morning. The nations are blessed through the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. All who will call upon this one will be saved. That's what was promised back to Abraham and that's what's been fulfilled for any Jew or Gentile this morning who will look to this seed, they will be brought into the promises of Abraham. And if that's not enough, you guys want more? I do. Zacharias says, this is the new covenant that God had promised to Israel as well. And I want you to look at verse 76 then. In verse 76 and you, child, John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. And you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death." I think verse 77 captures the heart of the new covenant so well. He will give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And th this is where Israel stumbled. I want you to think about this. Israel loved the Abrahamic covenant. They loved that God was going to bless that nation. They delighted over that. They loved the Davidic covenant. They've been waiting and looking for this king who would conquer their enemies and rule them and his kingdom would have no end. They delighted over that. Some still looking for it, but they choked. Many of them choked on this new covenant to come as a helpless sinner who can't earn your own righteousness to this Messiah who hung on a cross and said, it is finished. I've accomplished everything for salvation. Repent and believe in me and your sins, though they are scarlet, will be as washed as white as snow. They'll be separated as far as the east is from the west. They hated the, the message of the new covenant so much that they killed him when he told them they weren't righteous and your law keeping isn't going to get you in. Your being circumcised isn't going to get you in. The seed, Jesus Christ, and believing in him is the only way in. They hated it and they put him up on a cross. And the beauty of it all is that someday, the way I read Romans 11, is that God is going to save Israel. That whole nation is going to embrace Christ as the lamb that was slain for them. And they're going to look to him alone for the forgiveness of sins. They're going to have to look to this covenant alone to be forgiven of their sins. 
And now is the time of the fullness of the Gentiles to come in to take this gospel to the nations. And so we're to go and to proclaim Christ so that anyone, any nation, if they, they can be blessed through the seed of Abraham, if they will believe, they, they will be made his sons by faith. In Africa and China and New Guinea, wherever, God, they, they believe in this seed and they'll be saved. They can enter into the fullness of the joy of a new covenant. That is why you are alive is for this. You're not alive to have 2.5 children, vacations and houses and cars. You are alive for this new covenant. That's what you exist for this morning. And so what I'm going to try to do in the rest of our time is I just want to flush out the new covenant just a little bit more. I want to begin with this fulfillment of the new covenant. It begins that all men are sinners. When Adam sinned, we all went with him and we all come in spiritual stillborns as sinners. And I hope that didn't catch any of you off guard. That's what the fall did to every one of us. We come in with self as a center reference point. Sin is not so much what we do, though it is, but it's who we are. It goes to the very core of our being. The the, the stream will always be dirty because the fountain is dirty called our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful above all else. It'll trick you and deceive you. It's tricky. It's deceitful. That's the way the heart is as you come into this world. And so since Adam now, we are all plunged into this curse And Paul says there's none righteous, no, not even one. There's none who does good. To do righteousness is to do it for the right reason because you love God and no one comes into the world that way. We do it to try to earn God's love. We do it to feel better about ourselves. There are none righteous as you are born into this world. So what I want you to get from this then, guys, is sin is not so much external as it is internal. There's an internal problem, and Paul calls it the law of sin within. And we all come into this world with this law of sin. And so sin, guys, it's a power within us. And it rules, and it reigns, and it controls us. It has our heart, which is called mission control center. And so I want you to hear this. No promise of God, I will give you heaven can overcome the power of this law of sin that's within your own heart. And no threat from God, uh, eternal condemnation in hell, can overpower the law of sin within your heart this morning. No promise can overcome it, and no threat can overcome this power that is within you called the law of sin. So under the old covenant... The Mosaic law, keep this law, the Ten Commandments. Look to the law and just go do it. It didn't work because this law of sin, they could not love God and love other people. They could not fulfill the law. The old covenant required the right thing. And you had no ability to do it because of the body of sin. How can I love other people when there's a controlling force inside of me that loves myself? If you cross love of self, love of self will win. How is that going to be overcome? All this covenant did, the old covenant was heighten our sin. It brought about transgression. You're now violating God. And it says, don't do. And the body of sin starts saying, I want to do. I hate to confess this, but when I was an unbeliever, we had a neighbor with a doorbell that it said, don't ring, baby is sleeping. I had to ring that thing. (laughs) If you're not here next week, I'll understand why. I mean, that was who I was. I was naughty. And it said, stay off the grass. And I trampled their grass. And just every time it said, don't do, my law of sin wanted to do. So all this law did was bring hopelessness. The law was good. It told you the right thing to do. The problem was me. The problem was the law of sin and the depth of my sinful heart. And all these offerings that they kept giving just was a reminder of sin again and again. And so no matter how severe God threatened Israel, they couldn't stop. No matter how glorious the promises of God were to this nation, they could not stop sinning. It couldn't change the inside 
the body of sin, this heart that was selfish. They could not fix it. And the law showed them then that they needed grace and mercy from God because the law had none of that in it. It it couldn't grant them what they needed. It could just tell them what they should be. And Jesus Christ comes into the world. And listen to Hebrews 7. For on the one hand now, there's a setting aside of the former commandment, that old law, because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law could make nothing perfect. But on the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope, the new covenant, through which now we can draw near to God. Hebrews 8, 7, for if the first covenant was faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. We wouldn't have needed this new covenant. So here's our problem. Stay with me. We're almost done. Tying it all together. The Abrahamic covenant said, I will bless you. Yes, amen. I will do it all. I will give you blessings. The problem is they didn't have within their hearts to do what God said you needed to do to bring it about. There was a condition that he gave to Israel. How many times have you said, I'm going to obey God, I'm going to clean up my life, I'm going to quit doing this, I'm going to quit smoking and chewing and all the different stuff, and I just, I can't change. So the question is then, are they just doomed forever then to the cursings of God? How could they receive these blessings that God promised? They needed to be forgiven for their sins. Justice had to be satisfied. And they need a way in which they could obey God from the inside. So what they needed was a new covenant. And I want to read you just a couple verses in the Old Testament that God told Israel, guess what? I'm going to to give you what you really need. And just listen to Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand and to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, that old covenant, although I was a husband to them. I was a husband and they they disobeyed it and they broke it, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, what we're looking at this morning, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, And on their heart I'll write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, and I will forgive their iniquity, and their sins I will remember no more. There needs to be a change on the inside in this new covenant, he said. I'm going to put it within your heart. And I'm going to give you forgiveness of your sins, what you need to to have that conscience cleared and to have this record now where you can come and draw near and dwell with God. So do you see how beautiful this covenant is? It's the only remedy for sin and guilt and condemnation. This was the only remedy for sinners. And it brought a true deliverance from their enemies. And so that is what's taken place this day when Zacharias begins to sing and see the fullness of what God has done for the peoples of this world. I don't read a lot of books when I was growing up, I think two, but I had to write a book report and one of them was Robinson Crusoe. And he was a man, he was shipwrecked on an island and he comes under a deep sense of sin and humbling and he begins to take up the Bible and read it. And there's a Bible verse that says, call on me and I will deliver you. And he writes this in his journal. Now I began to construe the words in a different sense from what I had ever done before. For then I had no notion of anything being called deliverance, but my being delivered from this captivity I was on getting off this island. When I heard deliverance, nothing else would ever come to mind but getting off this island that I'm shipwrecked on. For though I was indeed at large in this place, yet the island was certainly a prison to me, and that in the worst sense of the word. But now I learn to take it in another sense. Now I look back upon my past life with such horror, and my sins appeared so dreadful that my soul sought nothing of God but deliverance 
from the load of guilt that bore down upon all of my comfort. As for my solitary life, it was nothing. I did not so much as pray to be delivered from it or think of it. It was all or no consideration in comparison to this weight of sin. All of my troubles, all of my isolations, all of my pain and affliction were nothing compared to the load of sin that I had now before God. I just wanted to be delivered from this load. Under the old covenant, all you could do is try to obey and have this load and this guilt of sin. You could labor for the rest of your life and you cannot remove the guilt of sin before God. You could never change your heart from the inside no matter how hard you work at it. No matter what you try, you can't make your heart love God and love His commandments. There's only one hope. The hope that Zacharias is singing about. In verse 77, he says he's going to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Caruso said, you will find deliverance from sin a much greater blessing than deliverance from your afflictions. The greatest need that you have here this morning is to get rid of that weight of sin and guilt weighing on you. And God has sent away in the climax of history and His Son coming to fulfill that law. He fulfilled its requirements and He fulfilled its penalties by hanging on a cross and receiving the justice and wrath of God for our sins that we deserve so that now we can be given forgiveness and to have the promise of Abraham that it's all the work of God, all that He did in Christ to give to you and all He asks is for an empty hand that looks away from anything in yourself and looks only to Jesus Christ to be saved. That's why Paul was so blessed that he got to preach the unfathomable riches of Christ Jesus. And I want you to listen to the rest because we're going to close with Isaiah. Okay, we looked at Isaiah last week. Look at verse 79. He's going to visit us with sunrise from on high to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Direct quote from Isaiah 9. And here it is. He's going to come and break into darkness. He's going to come and he's going to shine and show you in all the darkness of this world and sin and brokenness. There's this glorious light of salvation that has come and all who will come to the light will be saved and your darkness will be removed and your chains will fall off and your guilt and sin will be forgiven and you will be brought into a relationship with God. There's the promise of Isaiah. Here's the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. What was born in that manger... On Christmas morning was the climax of all of redemptive history. And this is why history existed. This is what God has been planning and purposing for all of history and eternity past. To put on display the tender mercy of our God. That Jews and Gentiles alike would all marvel at the mercy of a God like this. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to believe the unbelievable. And come, let us adore him and come, let us receive him. Christ the Lord, amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.